when Laundrette emerged, I'd done one cinema film, a small film in Scotland, um, and you know maybe a hundred rock and roll videos. And my shooting style was very early 80s, very extravagant, lots of wide lenses, lots of blue, lots of very saturated color. And we, 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 when I say we, us young cinematographers who were the first out of the film schools, I think what we were trying to do at that time was move away from the kind of flat, soft light of commercials. So the whole inclination was much more three-strip Technicolor, much more saturation, direct light, no bouncing. And so I, I was very, very much in that frame of mind when um, I was in South America actually doing a, a Mick Jagger extravaganza in somewhere, somewhere hot. And uh, I heard that Stephen, who I'd met on the comic strip, uh, I'd heard that he'd got this script called My Beautiful Laundrette. He was already a famous English film director and I was a, a nowhere student from a film school. So I was very excited with the idea of doing this television film. But I also heard in the same phone call it was being offered to Chris Mengis because he was his regular cameraman. But then fate intervened because Chris had won the Oscar for Killing Fields and been offered the mission with Roland Joffe. And of course, the mission, beautiful laundrette, Let's, let's go do the mission. So I was very lucky. And that started a, a long period with Stephen over mm, almost 15 years. I did maybe eight films, something like that. From a cinematography point of view, I always knew that people like Al Mendros and Nick Vist and those, those really naturalistic DPs were the ones I loved. You know, I loved photography to disappear in the film that's always been my aim and intention is that is that you shouldn't watch the photography although when I look at my beautiful laundrette now you know what is it 30 years later or something I can see that that is quite stylized a lot more stylized than what I started doing 10 years later so to some extent I kind of look at it and think oh what happened you know <laughs> And what I can see in Laundrette, actually, is, is a kind of transition for me, a sort of struggle to leave behind some of the colours and, and ideas about shooting that I've become used to in doing all these years of rock and roll. It was part of the period where I would use quite extravagant colour uh, in a way that I no longer do. Um, and Lighting colour on colour, like if you saw something green at night and you wanted it greener, you'd put a green gel on the light and make the green greener. Uh, that, that was a, a thing I'd been doing for some years with Julian Temple um, in the rock and roll world, was exaggerating colour by lighting with colour. And then you'd try and kind of keep it off the actors mostly, but around the background you'd get some quite dazzling colours happening um, because of this technique. Now, whilst I don't think I was doing that much in Laundrette, um, I was definitely using at night, you know, the kind of moonlight blue would have been a much stronger blue than the one I'd use today. And say the amber of a street light would be a much stronger amber and the contrast between them would be more violent. And, and I noticed actually in the notes I was looking through that I put with the script that, you know, some of the notes would say things like, uh, this should clash, or this should be strong, or uh, this must be bold here. And so I was obviously making notes to myself where I was, I was like, don't wimp out, just don't be normal. Be, be extravagant when you need to be. It wasn't a Ken Loach film. It wasn't a kind of naturalistic film. It needed to have a very kind of, a bold and specific look. I knew it was a bold film. I hadn't shot men kissing and stuff at that point. There was a time five years later when Stephen and I, I think when we did The Grifters, we were shocked when a man kissed a woman. And we looked at each other and went, oh, this is new. Because we'd done My Beautiful Andrette, Sammy and Rosie, Prick Up Your Ears. So we, we seemed to be the like go-to for guy movies <laughs> that kissed each other.
they didn't seem to me so much be about passion as friendliness. And that very much came from the way um, Daniel and, and Gordon were doing it and, and how Stephen was directing it. He was directing it as fun. And it feels like that. And I think it felt like that to shoot. In fact, you know, when, when Daniel did the thing with the champagne and then dripped it in his mouth, I don't think any of us knew he was going to do that. I think we got the shot sorted out and Stephen said, oh, well, you'll kiss him here and, you know, and then he just did it. And that was very typical of the way most things developed that we were shooting, that the onset atmosphere of the film was extremely good. At the time, I was just doing what I do. And, and following my hunches and my instincts, and so was Stephen, and we were working together, and, and that's how it came about. So it wasn't so much a construction as more just an instinct of, oh, let's do it this way, oh, let's do this shot. And Stephen doesn't do storyboards. We would turn up, rehearse, and shoot it. And then the shooting, the specific lighting and camera placement and so on was very much born of the action, born on the day. Stephen was really good at identifying where the camera should be and when. And if I put the camera somewhere that was inappropriate, he, he would spot that very fast. And this is, of course, you're talking no video tap. You're talking 16 millimeter. So it's just me at the camera. And Stephen never looked through cameras, but he would stand right next to it and know what lens you were on. Wow. And he had a very clear sense of the frame. Your father's done well. A traditional director like Stephen has a very clear sense of, of the fear. He'll, he'll like notice the camera out the corner of his eye and notice how it moves in relation to the actors. So if an actor's like walking across the room and there's a camera moving and the actor stops and the camera doesn't, he'd pick up on that straight away. And he'd say, cut, and he'd look at me and I'd go, yeah, we should do another one. And I'd know that he'd know we overshot or we were slightly out of rhythm. So he, he always had a very good sense of that. I, hand on my heart, can say, you know, I pretty much learned everything I know about shooting films from Stephen and with Stephen. Things went on. <laughs> I got out of bed and went to the balcony and opened the door. We shot just about everything in under five takes, I would say. And quite often just three, two or three. I was accustomed to moving quite quickly you know, we would set up, we would shoot, do a few takes, move on. But really in the 80s period I worked with him, from, from Laundrette right through to the Grifters, my memory, and memory of course gets distorted, but my memory is that we would just do a few and move on. So the actual number of setups per day and the rhythm of... A, when you do a lot of takes, it affects the rhythm very strongly of how people feel in the room from the actors right through the crew, everybody else. Because when the crew knows maybe there's going to be at least 15 takes, every, these days everyone's off on their cell phone. <laughs> they would just disappear and start texting, you know, and dis they just dial out knowing it's going to be half an hour before you come back. If you do just Clint style, you know, two or three takes, it has a mesmerizing effect on crews because they know that there's no time to go off even though you're doing one shot because you're going to wrap that shot very quickly and do the next one. I want to be manager of this place. I think I can do it. Please let me. <laughs> Here I was thinking how to tell your father how four punks nearly drowned you in a washing machine. On the other hand, a little water on the brain might clear your thoughts. OK. Another thing Stephen said to me once, I said to him, so when you shape an actor's performance from take one to say take five or something, how do you do that? And he said, oh, I always give the actor take one. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, what I mean is the actor's been up all night learning his lines and staring at the script, or he might have been if he's not lazy. And he's going to bring to the set a, a really preconceived thought out idea, this is how I want to do this. So take one is kind of the actor's idea that they've labored long and hard and they hit you with take one. And then 
the director comes and shapes it to the take they want. Now, it may be they think take one's brilliant, do a couple more and you're done and you move on because the actor's kind of nailed it. Or it may be that the director's had a different idea of how it should be. So then a good director will shape it without necessarily the actor knowing quite what's going on. Irma just runs you around everywhere, like a servant. I'll stay here with my friend and fight it out. My family, Salim and all, will swallow you up like a little kebab. <laughs> Another thing I remember very clearly uh, working with Stephen in those days is he would not cover any scene. Uh, like, if you'd done a scene in a two-shot or a moving master or something, and he wanted a close-up, well, today, if you want that close-up, you run the scene in the close-up, not them. He would identify in the script, I want a close-up for those three lines. He would just shoot those three lines in the close-up and not shoot the rest of the scene. And then he'd turn around the other actor, just shoot the three lines. Sometimes he'd just shoot one line. And it's an interesting, technically, it's very interesting when you do that because you're saying to an actor, all right, you're going to say two lines in the close-up. And when you go, all right, do another one, he's only got the two lines to think about, not two pages. Now, in today's filmmaking, you will always do the two pages. So that was a feature of that type of filmmaking in those days, was the precision. He's on dole, like everyone else in England. Something I really learned from Stephen was to be spare about close-ups and also not, you know, not to shoot this. I don't think there's a single one of these in Laundrette. So the great thing about the close-up is that, you know, it's like hitting the drum in the orchestra or something. Just if you keep it a little bit back and then go there when you really need it, then it'll have more impact. Eyelash. But if you use it constantly all the time, you just run out of anywhere to go. One of the things that happened was that 16 millimeter film stock in those days was really good if it was slow, the slow stock. So the one that was 100 ASA um, looked good on TV and as it turned out, looked okay in the cinema. Now, I, did, I do remember having this thought about the night work because we had some night work outside the laundrette and, the, you know, there was some, some night stuff in the movie. And I did a little test with the faster stock because that was 400 ASA or something. And I looked at it and I thought, this looks awful because this isn't Super 16, this is regular old standard 16. And I just thought it looked grainy and horrid and so I kind of looked at the night work we were going to do and figured, well, I can just get some more lights and I'll use the slow stock. So when in post-production or actually after release, or whenever it was, somebody decided this is going in the cinema, it was a massive relief to me that I hadn't used the fast stock because that really would have looked pretty awful. Vauxhall, as it's called in London, that, that wasn't a great neighbourhood back in the day. There were units who'd, who'd filmed down there and had ball bearings dropped on their heads from, you know, the top of blocks of flats. So it wasn't a fun place to be in terms of... We're not talking St John's Wood here, you know, we're talking rough London. And I think, I think that really helped us all feel the sensibility of, of this world, this laundrette and this street and, the, and the, that kind of gang feeling. And a lot of the spatial elements really fell into place by choosing that building. Uh, and, you know, the glass, the reflections in the glass, the, there were lots of great stuff that we wouldn't, if that had been a set, it just wouldn't have had the same feeling at all. And, and all the beating up stuff outside with the, you know, the car and things. It, it, it was all very real feeling, you know. I, we had very little... Um, studio work i'm not sure there's any actually but i expect there is but it was a real location-based film it was a friend once for years 
It's very effective in, in Roshan's apartment there. I mean, that whole thing with the train is fantastic. Just everything about a real place, if it matches the script, is a tremendous benefit to a film. Where did you go? You just disappeared. Drinking, I went, with me old mates. It ain't illegal. I've always been fascinated by um, the way light interacts uh, both in terms of sunlight and daylight, uh, and particularly with city light. City light, I used to, when I first went to New York, uh, I used to kind of be in some apartment and stare at the ceiling and see all that, what was going on in the street five stories down would be happening on the ceiling, you know, that the way it moves and the color and the, the kind of shapes that you get. And I, I've always loved shooting through things with the reflections uh, on windows. And, but in terms of city light, you know, you, you really, the world's, the world's available of your imagination because in cities you have all colors and all kinds of light and they move and they reflect. So you can, you can, you can base urban lighting on just observation in a city. Now, when you try and do that on a film and get it right, it's actually not so easy. Uh, but if you can get it right, it feels very authentic because most people, they don't study light. It's, it's extraordinary, actually, how only, only really painters and cinematographers and photographers study light, actually step back and go, oh, I'm going to look at the light. But when a when member of the public watches a film, they're looking at light. It, it is light. I mean, the very, very essence of a film is light. You're projecting light, and it consists of black, white, and color. So, so an artist, you know, would say as a found object, film is light, um, and nothing else. The Connie Hall rain, as it were, look is something I think all of us kind of carry around as, as one of the tricks in the pocket. And that was very much a scene where I thought, oh, this will be perfect for this. You know, this will look really good. And so, um, so I did it to the best of my abilities. And I remember thinking, yeah, it's not as good as Connie Hall does it. You need money, just ask me. Years ago, your uncles lifted me up. And I will do the same thing. You have to, you get this mirror and you run water down it and you get a very small bulb that's at the right distance. And it, it's kind of a delicate thing to get it to feel exactly right. Um, it involves a lot of faffing around with stuff, you know, that can hold you up. <laughs> and so it, it, the thing about Connie, all the stories about Connie are that he took forever in working with somebody like Stephen or in kind of normal filmmaking, that luxury is not available. So, so you have to do the best you can in the time you've got without removing time from the actors and the director to get the film they're trying to make. Don't ever offer me money. It was an educational test I put on you to make you see you did a wrong thing. But lighting is lighting and you you can't fix that. It, it is what it is on the set, on the day. You can fiddle with it, but you f the fundamental tone of how a set is lit, you can't subtract that in post. You can enhance it, you can play with outside, inside, but you go to any post colorist and say, can you relight this? They, a producer will say, yeah, sure. A colorist will say no. And I think, I think that will remain the case for a very, very long time. Films that stand up historically, it's mysterious, isn't it? I find it very mysterious. I don't know why Laundrette's a good film, and I don't know why The Grifters is a good film. I also don't know why several others of the 50-odd movies I've shot are not good films, because Quite often you'll have a great director or a great script or a great actor and you'll, you'll all go forth and do your best work and end up with something that doesn't work. And 
there's a lot of, to me there's a huge amount of mystery in, into what makes a great film so if you think about when you actually shoot a film and you're actually there on set I don't think any of us know you just don't know whether you're making a good film or you aren't what you do know is that you try as hard as you possibly can everybody in all departments to make the best possible film you can make but the actual summation of well is it is it good somebody says to me oh do you think that's going to be any good and i'm working on a film i just go i have no idea